Imagine a world where more women have the time to fully explore their genius. Welcome to She Rebel Radio, the UK's podcast for women leaders and founders ready to unlearn conventional rules and lead their businesses of significance. Hailed for counter status quo ideas and a whole dose of feminine perspective, this is our International Women's Day series sponsored by our headline partners, NatWest. My name's Lulu Mins. I host retreats and create spaces for women leaders to explore their genius. And today, I'm going to create that same space right here for you on this podcast. Welcome to episode 116 of She Rebel Radio. Embrace technology with Sharon Abobe. Sharon is the founder of Orbit, which provides impactful data analytics for businesses to make better marketing decisions through a data-driven 3D design suite and analytics dashboard. Teaching herself to code via YouTube videos, Sharon started Orbit initially to support artists and interior designers, as previously she built her art sales experience in New York, Lagos and Toronto. During her role as a founding member of the modern and contemporary African art business at Sotheby's, the department sold over £30 million of art and broke 40 world records for sale prices. Gaining a commendation as one of the top 10 in the 100 female entrepreneurs to watch list with Nat West and The Telegraph, Sharon has also featured in Apollo magazine's 2021 global list of 40 under 40 art tech innovators, as well as the Financial Times, Virgin Magazine and Black Girl Nerds, which celebrates the intersection of geek culture and black feminism. It's amazing to have you here today, Sharon. How are you doing? I'm wonderful. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a real, real pleasure. And there's a lot of accolades to squeeze in there for your (laughs) introduction. And we're just getting started. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I can feel that. I can feel that energy (laughs) from you, which is great. Really, really great. And I'd love to start that you taught yourself to code via YouTube videos. What was your driver to doing this? And why did you decide that you needed to be a woman who could code? Well, I I consider myself to be a bit of a rebel and I don't like to have things that I don't know how to do. Um, It was also a bit of a need. I needed to learn how to code to build a website. Um, Back in the day when I was learning um, about business and university, I had an art blog actually, and I would write about art and um, modify the website myself on Blogspot. So that was my first introduction to HTML, um, you know, making text bold and italicized, very simple things, but still, you know, getting a bit more technical than usually um, most people would. And over time, once I then, um, left my role at Sotheby's, I wanted to learn how to build different solutions and I would tinker with different applications, try and see if I could fix them and modify them. And so I started to freelance um, just to earn some money to support myself and would take on different projects for clients as a freelancer. Mm-hmm. Um, and with that, over time, developed that into a, a, an agency. Where we hired a team and built a team to provide these services uh, professionally for clients. Yeah, amazing. So it sounds like just kind of one thing has led to another and kind of opened up into where it is that you're at now. And you've traveled and sold art in some of my favorite places, New York and Toronto, although sadly, I've not been to Lagos. But what did that experience teach you about business and sales and the art world or, you know, perhaps even yourself? I think we can learn so much when we travel as well. Mm, I absolutely agree. Anytime I visit a new city, I have to visit a local museum. I think it's one of the most essential ways of understanding culture and different places. And just like food is that introduction for people, is it for me? Um, So yeah, I've had this love relationship with New York that just doesn't end. (laughs) I've been in and out and back and forth with a few times for the past year, a few years. Um, But what I learned was I think it was, it it taught me to be more open-minded about culture, about different ways of being and doing and existing. Mm -hmm. And that gave me this sense of wanderlust and excitement to discover and experience the world. I should also say, um, I'm also someone who's just lives in different countries. So I was born in Ghana, raised in Toronto, um, live in the UK. So I've always had this um, inclination and, and, and interest in different places in the world yeah um so this experience taught me about for example in new york i discovered a very um diverse and broad range of um, art disciplines art museums arts practices and artists and um being in lagos is also a different 
a community of vibrant artists with a long history of modern and contemporary art. Mm-hmm. And in Toronto, which is a bit more conservative, but still a very layered uh, history as well. And that gave me an appreciation of different types of collectors and different ways in which business is conducted um, to be able to serve a more international clientele. Yeah, and it's you're quite right. It's such an important thing to do. And it's the first thing I do is go to um, a museum or art gallery. And I used to moan about it as a teenager because that's what my parents used to make us do. <laughs> and now <laughs> it's, it's totally impacted me. That's the first thing that I do too, to get a feel for a place. Yeah, yeah. It's the first thing. You must do it. I, last time I was in Lisbon um, when I was traveling and I had to go, I got, I left the air- airport and went straight to the museum. Yeah. <laughs> that was the first thing I did. <laughs> yeah, I did. Uh, before lockdown, actually, I went to, um, oh, I can't remember which exhibition it was now, but I went to an exhibition in London on my own. I've never done it on my own. I've always been with other people, I think. And um, mm-hmm. then we had lockdown and it was a kind of a creative date that I took myself on. I was so pleased that I'd had that day by myself just doing galleries mm-hmm. in London. It was yeah, amazing. So fun. Yeah. So how did you spot a gap in the art market and the technological world? Mm. I always say, I mean, the art market is a very exciting world in general. Um, we do many things very well. One of the things we don't do very well is that we're very slow to adapt technology and innovation. Um, <laughs> because in its own way, the the traditional ways in which we conduct business and and way we carry ourselves in the art world, it is a bit of culture, but it also means that sometimes you know, it's just, it's taken us so long to start talking about artist resale rights and standardizing that. And the blockchain has pushed that conversation forward. But still, traditionally, it, it can take a while for different innovations to be adopted in, in the art world. Um, but I think around 2020, there was this shift where, I mean, a lot of artists were stuck at home. Everyone was stuck at home. It was the pandemic. Um, and a more of a, a push towards technology in a digital space to innovate around new ways of con- of connecting with um, audiences yeah. and so we saw a wave of galleries and museums now everyone being stuck at home having to find ways to connect with their um their visitors and and, and their clientele um yeah. so that i think was that it was out of necessity that that was there was that push yeah but leading up to that i had always known that having learned how to code, that I would want to find a way to combine my interest in art and technology. So it was always going to happen. It was just that at that time, it just worked really well together in terms of the the need, the demand, and um, the services being available. So it it was a really nice, um, what would you say, fate? Yeah. (laughs) Fate and the world and everything happening at the right time. um, That made it a great moment uh, to get started on that end. Yeah, and definitely, you know, the art world being so traditional in many ways, being kind of forced, as you say, in in to the necessity of suddenly not being able to go to art galleries and and us not being able to see what's out there, is um yeah definitely the right time and the right place for sure. And everything that you've done, kind of leading you up to that point, which I always feel is that perfect alignment piece, really. Exactly. Exactly. Now, you've also used tech to fund your business with grants from Innovate UK and Amazon Web Services. As we know, funding for women in business in particular can be really, really tough. Um, And I understand you're planning to raise more investment this year. How can we use tech to raise investment? Mm, That's a great question there. I think definitely as a woman in business, uh, I mean, it's it's really frustrating to even have the conversation, but it can be very difficult to access funding. Um, and it, it's a challenge and it also creates an opportunity to be creative and innovative actually in how mm. you raise funding. So um, for me, actually, I turned to Innovate UK because it was hard to raise money from investors. Um, mm-hmm. So that was what pushed me to, you know, to apply for these grants and, and we were successful, which was great. Um, but it also pushed us to be more um, strategic about our innovations. Um, so that's how tech has played a key role there. Yeah. And then in particular partnerships with um, ecosystems like AWS, um, being able to join the startup uh, community, working much more closely with solution architects and um, members of that community have really helped us leverage cloud computing tools, um, credits, uh, funding, um, and get that support there as well. So it's been about taking the existing challenges of 
founding in general and yeah. be more strategic in leveraging connections and being part of the right communities to get that funding, whether it be in cash, in credit, in kind, in services, infused into the business to get us to the next level. Yeah, I love how you've seen that as a kind of, you know, the difficulty with investors turning that into an asset really of being more strategic and innovative in in what you're bringing, uh, for sure. Any insight on why it's so difficult for investors to get investment from investors, particularly with technology? I thought they'd be right on that. Yeah, I mean, it depends. There are multiple factors at play. Um, and, and I know there's, there's been a fair bit of a conversation going, ongoing, and even with the recession that we're entering now, um, it makes it even more difficult for diverse uh, groups and also women to to get the same access because we are even more penalized in these market conditions. Mm. Um I read a statistic that I think was about 2% of funding um, last year went to women founded yeah. businesses, which is wild. Um, and when you start to talk about uh, black women or women of color, it's like 0.01 or something absolutely ridiculous. Wow. Um, yeah. So it's, it's just about bias, about bias and also having the right uh, network access and all these factors that play that make it even more difficult Um but yeah, I don't know. The, I can't give a, a reason, but I know it's it's a circumstance that I work through, that other female founders I know work through, and we're forced to find creative ways of 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 competing in this market, um, even though we have different circumstances that we're dealing with. Most yeah. of the time, not you know related to the business, but just who we are. Yeah, yeah. I found someone. I can't remember her name actually, but I'd love to have her on the podcast at some point. That had done a study that women. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know how diverse that study was, but are asked more pre- preventative based questions by investors compared right. to their male counterparts. So they're all risk based of like, you know, because we're seen as a higher risk in inverted commas, um, which was really interesting. So I'd love to get her on at some point <laughs> to extend that mm-hmm. conversation for sure. Um, th- thank you for sharing your experience. How do you envision, envision technology and AI becoming even more part of the future? And I asked that question as well, Sharon, because I feel, uh, knowing my audience, that a lot of them are probably a little bit tech phobe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, technology and AI are already here. <laughs> it's no longer a future conversation. It's here. Um, we interact with AI and technology, different technology forms, every day without even knowing it actually. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, with the emergence of chat GPT and all these different tools, it's become even more popular, but they have been existing. This kind of technology has been existing for a while. It's just been popularized in more user-friendly formats. Yeah. Um, you know, when you talk about machine learning and deep learning and um, AI, these are different technologies that companies like Amazon and Google and um, your favorite companies are using them to provide your services. So <laughs> we experience yeah. them every day. We just don't know it. Um, I would say that um, these technologies make force us to be more, um, again, creative and innovative about how we think about uh, new businesses, about new services, new solutions, because now these technologies are automating workflow. Yeah. Um, and so we're going to have to think about how we change um and up- adapt our businesses to make sure that we're able to provide better quality services and products um, with these in mind. Otherwise, we're going to be left behind. Um, mm. It's already here. So <laughs> unfortunately, for those who are a bit more um, hesitant to adapt, I-, I would encourage you to get involved. Mm. Get involved, learn about these um, innovations and how you can use them to move and um, improve your businesses and grow because if you don't there are other businesses that will do that Um, and so we're going to have to just adapt there's no question yeah and it's it's leaving kind of the industrial revolution behind isn't it and and that technology is taking over the production you know the productivity and I think we as humans still value ourselves quite often on how productive we are but how useful is that moving forward in the future when tech can do a lot of that yeah and we can make our lives easier so the things that are you know let's say you're working on something and it's taking you forever to repeat that same task, make your life easier by using technology to repeat that. So you can focus more on impactful uh, decisions that can help your business grow. Yeah. And as you've said, I think it's come across quite clearly your message in terms of that 
um, allowing more creative solutions and to be more creative because you know we, we don't have to worry about some of that production stuff which I know the listeners always love a bit of creativity so how can we as women leaders embrace technology in our lives and businesses what what are your top tips mm. I would say first my first tip would be uh, don't take no for an answer um, and I say that because as a woman founder, woman business, a woman in business, um, oftentimes it's already decided for us that we are not uh, capable or able to work with technology to the same degree as our male counterparts. And so there's already that barrier of perception. And that's something I absolutely refuse to accept. Um, oftentimes on my own team or working with other people in different companies, they'll often assume that I am not technical, which is something I will not hesitate to clarify. <laughs> um, yeah. And yeah, I think it's important to do that because we are just as capable, if not more capable actually, um, of working with technology in more innovative and extensive ways of solving problems. And um, just giving yourself permission to do that first is important. Yeah. Um, and I would say that's the first tip I would say. I was going to say, I don't one... know if you know, Sharon, but is it true that some of the first coders were actually women? I've heard that somewhere, but I don't know if it's actually true. Yes. I mean, I, I would backstory, but I wouldn't, I'm not surprised about that. Um, <laughs> no. I'm really not surprised yet. Because there are many ways in which we think differently and that are actually strengths in, in programming. Um, we're more resourceful. We're more um, open-minded and, and creative about just problem, solve, problem solving. Um, and actually, I think one of the things that we could also do more is ask questions. It's okay to ask questions. And if you don't know something, ask a colleague or there's a YouTube video on it somewhere or a tutorial. And there are lots of different resources, especially with platforms like AWS and Google um, startups that actually support founders in learning and, and using new technologies. Um, and mm -hmm. sometimes it's just about giving yourself permission to be in that room, be in that webinar, be in that workshop and work with partners that will support you. Um, and that's really the, usually the main obstacle. Um, yeah. So that's the main tip I would say, just have the audacity to ask and to say, no, I, I know this, I am skilled in this area, or I can be skilled in this area and go for it. There's absolutely no reason why we should even be talking about women in technology because it's, it's, it's just no reason why I think we're just as capable, if not more. Yeah. And I think as women as also, we see the interconnectedness between all things quite a lot, don't we? Which must, you know, I mean, I can't code for, for love nor money, but I think that that must be an asset, I would say. Yeah. And you don't have to code to work in technology. That's also no. a misconception. We have technical project managers. We have um, those who actually work with developers. You don't have to know how to code. It's also about working on, on on planning projects and being strategic about the technologies. Um, so that is also something that a lot of people think, but there are a wide range of tools and um, roles that you can play in, in the industry without knowing how to code. Yeah, brilliant. Any other top tips that you were going to share? Uh, I think, I mean, I think those are really it. It's, yeah. I think once you give yourself the permission and you have the audacity to ask for help and support, everything else falls in line. Yeah. Um, for example, I was just at this uh, this all day uh, workshop with uh, Amazon just last week, and we went through a more in depth uh, exploration of one of the software tools. And I think I was probably one of the few women in that room, probably one of three in yeah. a room of like twenty five or so. Mm -hmm. um, but it did not make a difference. I just made some great connections, <laughs> built the business further, and we're moving ahead. So I think it's just giving yourself that permission. I, I can't emphasize that enough. Yeah, yeah. And that carries through in so many industries as well. Definitely. Yeah. Now, what three things are you going to be embracing this year? Mm. Well, this year, in 2023, <laughs> we are at a time where uh, things are changing quickly, um, economically and um, politically. Yeah. Um, I would say working in business, one thing I'm embracing is uh, focus. Mm -hmm. focus on my key objectives and what's most important and most impactful um I should also say I'm an introvert I don't know if that's a surprise to you but <laughs> um it means that you know I'm able to really think and more like a high level detail about specific um 
behaviors of people around me or making decisions, I'm, I tend to drill down to the detail and be very observant, but it also means I need to conserve my energy to focus on the most impactful things. So focus is really important for how I could perform very well. Yeah, thanks um, for drawing that think... distinction as well. I was going to say, Sharon, I'm introverted as well, and I, I'm totally with you on that. I shared that at the event with NatWest yesterday. And um, yeah, but it's important how we can drill down on the detail, but need to take care of your energy. Exactly. And I think that that's something that we should also talk more about. I, I haven't seen as much literature or conversation on that about introverted um, founders and leaders, but there are a whole wide range of them. Mark Zuckerberg is an introvert. I hear Bill Gates and a whole um, group of other founders um, are as well. So it's it's a skill and it's a different way of thinking, but I think it, it makes a difference in our world. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that and I would say just patience on self-love and taking care of yourself when you are you are at your best you're able to perform well and I think in the hustle and bustle of this world sometimes it gets a bit too much Um, but knowing where uh, it's important to maintain self-care habits like exercise eating well getting enough sleep those are different ways in which I am embracing uh, these habits to make sure that I'm at my best at all times. Yeah, because technology sped everything up so much, hasn't it, that it's really important that we take a step back and slow down because we can do things yeah. so quickly now. Yeah. Now, how did it feel to receive a commendation for the top 100 female entrepreneurs to watch list? And what additional support for the business are you looking forward to receiving? Mm, how did it feel? Um I was surprised. I was pleasantly surprised and thankful and appreciative. Um, it's been an incredible experience um, from the beginning. It's 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 just been a wonderful experience. First, being around other female founders, female entrepreneurs, uh, the experience it was it was very inspiring. Just being in the same room, right there from the first events, we were all you know sharing tips and ideas with each other it was <laughs> actually quite productive um with the, that first event so I really enjoyed discovering and learning more about other ways that women are um doing amazing things in business I've made some new friends from the initiative um that we're actually still talking today and supporting each other with resources um it also opened the door for new um business opportunities actually and we're working on uh introducing some software to one of the partners from the program actually um and i'll be back in london after that so it's 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 been very productive giving us exposure um connections and new business opportunities yeah yeah it's so important isn't it to have those powerful rooms of other women that you know that are are really opening up now and and the Mm -hmm. power of network which hasn't you know really been available absolutely yeah now what is next for you and where can we find you sharon Mm. Um, what's next for me well we're releasing new products with Orbit so uh, more data driven uh, product solutions uh, for businesses so we'll be releasing more of that this year mm-hmm. um, I will also be doing some more work on the art side so I've just had an article that's been published in a journal called Inca Journal that's going to be coming out very soon um, and then more content as well around uh, arts and technology we'll be releasing a few uh, interviews as well on a podcast um, so the best way to find me is on Twitter and Instagram at Rose of Sharon O. That's where I tend to post more content. Um, and yeah, I'm active on LinkedIn as well and on social media. But um, yeah, that's that's the best way to connect with me. Amazing. It's been really great to have you, Sharon. Thank you so much for being with us on She Rebel Radio. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to She Rebel Radio. We thank you for listening and thank our headline partners, NatWest, for sponsoring this series. If this episode has inspired you, please pass it on and share with at least one other incredible woman. And don't forget to hit subscribe and leave us a review. You can find out more about me and my work at lulumins.com or on most social media platforms.